Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Remembering the Legendaries with Jim Irwin, the show that honors Wayne State University faculty and staff of the past, remembering their enormous contributions to making Wayne State the great university it is today. He's a local businessman, a best-selling author, and a published songwriter. He has two degrees from Wayne State and is welcome. honored as a distinguished welcome, university welcome alumnus. Everybody. Let's give a big welcome to our host, Jim Irwin. From this beautiful campus in the heart, Wayne State University, here we are. Welcome. All right. This is the first in a series of shows where we're going to remember the people who were the impact players here at Wayne State. The ones who, by virtue of what they did here, what they sought out here in terms of knowledge and students and the people they trained, what they accomplished. Most of them, if not all of them, have passed away, but they had an impact here, and we're, we're lucky enough to have people around who still remember them. So the focus of our show, Remembering the Legendaries, is to bring these people back to life, not through the printed page of what you might read in a biography about them, but through remembering them as, as real people. Because after all, Wayne State, real people, don't they go together? Wouldn't you agree with that? <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay. So now our, our first guest in our first show, we're going to talk uh, to the man in charge, the dean of fine performing and communication arts. His whole career has been here. He's a wonderful guy. He's a pal of mine. Please help me welcome Dean Matt Seeger. Matt. <laughs> How are you, Jim? All right. Thank you. Welcome to the show, Matt. Glad to be here. Dean, Thank you, Jim. What, what amazes me is your name, Matthew Wayne Seeger. How appropriate. It was a natural fit, you know, <laughs> well, your entire, from the beginning. Your entire career has been here. Yes. And uh, what made you uh, an Indiana small town guy? who went through Indiana University, got the doctor's degree, and then looked around. What made a small town boy come to this big unit, a big town of Detroit back in 1983? Am I right, 83? 83, 83, August of 83. Yep. Mm -hmm. What made you choose us here at Wayne? Well, it, it was a really interesting time. I had, I had finished my, my uh, graduate work, my doctoral work at Indiana University in Bloomington, which is, of course, a, a wonderful little small town in Indiana, lots of corn. Uh, and I had grown up in northern Indiana in a lot of small towns. There's lots of corn in Michigan here, <coughs> well, too. Well, there's lots of corn in Michigan, too, but not so much in Detroit. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I had finished my degree, and I had applied for jobs, and I had three or four interviews and two or three offers at, at smaller schools, regional schools. And then sort of at the last minute, right when I was ready to accept one of those other offers, I got a call from... Uh, from George Ziegelmuller, who was the area head for speech communication. At One the of time. our legendaries. We're going to have a program devoted entirely to George. Amazing man, and he said, "You know, we've gotten your application, and we'd we'd really like you to uh, to come up and interview." And my uh, my faculty advisors at Indiana said, "You know, I talked to them, and they said Wayne State is an amazing place. It has incredible people." Uh, and, and you absolutely must go up. You must postpone these other offers, and you must go up and, and talk to them. So I, I got in my car, and I drove you know, from, from Indiana into Detroit. It's the first time I'd ever been to Detroit, and uh, had, a, had a really interesting experience here. I won't say it was an easy interview. It was a really tough interview. Okay, what happened? Well, uh, Bernie Brock, who was one of the faculty members here, picked on me. He, he uh, uh, quizzed me about all this, this information that I was supposed to know. Why would anybody pick on you? Well, I You're don't know. You're just an ordinary kind of nice guy. I guess I was an easy target. Happy, lucky, Indiana boy. I think he wanted to make sure that I was up to the job. And, you know, <laughs> he, he, he sort of peppered me with questions and, and made it a little tough. Uh, uh, but, you know, he, he really was trying to figure out if I knew my stuff. Um, George, of course, was incredibly wonderful, and I actually stayed at George Ziegelmuller's house uh, when I was here visiting. And I, I remember a, a lovely uh, dinner with uh, Ed Pappas, another one of our legends, and uh, George Ziegelmuller at Joe Muir's. 
And I don't think I'd ever been in a restaurant quite that nice in my life. You know, here I was a corn. Right. Uh, did a, they serve corn? Uh, they did not serve corn. <laughs> but uh, it was it was really a, an interesting moment, introduction to the culture of Detroit. And uh, uh, so I, I had a very good interview, um, a very good experience. I left the interview thinking there's no way they'll offer me this job. They'll, there's no way they're going to offer me this job. But by the time I got back to my, my home in Bloomington, uh, I had a phone call. And George offered me the job. And uh, you know, there really wasn't a question. It was a wonderful opportunity to come to Detroit, to be part of Detroit, uh, to work with graduate students, to work with a different student population that I'd worked with at, uh, uh, at Indiana. So it was, a, it was a real treat to be able to participate, to learn about the urban experience and be part of that. Well, when I first met you, uh, you, you came across as a very down-to-earth kind of thing. It was at a dinner. If I remember right, yeah. and uh, uh, I was impressed with you. And word later on came out that that the people who wanted to bring you here, they wanted you probably more than you wanted them at the time. They looked they upon you. They didn't let me know at the moment, or I would ask for more money. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> no, they they, uh, they brought you up. Uh, they considered you a rising star, and uh, your career started out uh, in in wasn't it? teaching and then forensics or debate for a while and then why don't you just briefly go right through your steps. Yeah, I did some uh, competitive public speaking, some debate and some forensics. I'd, I'd been very active in high school. I had coached in college. I did my uh, undergraduate degree at a small school in southern Indiana, the University of Evansville. Uh, and I worked on the student newspaper and worked in the student radio station at the time. Uh, and I had been, I went to Northern Illinois and DeKalb, Illinois and did my master's degree and I worked in debate and forensics there, competitive public speaking. Uh, and then I went to Bloomington for my PhD and I majored in organizational communication. Uh, and I majored in organizational communication because I was really interested in what was sort of a growing field then, sure. the role of communication in organizations. Sure. Sure. And when I got the offer to come to Detroit, I mean it was, it was like literally being a kid in a candy store. This, there were so many opportunities for research and to work with incredible people here. You know, one of my first classes, I had Lee Iacocca's speechwriter in my class. And so I started talking to her and, and you know, we developed a, a nice working relationship. And a year later, I edited the collection of Lee Iacocca's speeches. And there's, there's no other place in the country you know, a, a brand new wet behind the sure. ears assistant professor could sure. have worked with somebody like that. So, so briefly, tell us how you got all the way up to your present job. <laughs> well, a lot of accidents along the way, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, I, I came here in 83 as an assistant professor, and the process is that you go through a, a six year probationary period before you go up for tenure. So, uh, and I had great mentorship from George Ziegelmuller and Ed Pappas and Bernie Brock and Ray Ross, these really very, very well-known, established full These professors. are people we're going to talk about. Yeah, established. Eight, we'll have separate programs on, on some of them, and, uh, and uh, we'll put a couple together in other programs. So you're going to hear more about them in future programs. But the names he's mentioned are legendaries. People will be on the program. Yeah, these were really very, very well-known people in the field, just very well-respected. And I had the advantage of working with them. Uh, and I, I had actually replaced two faculty members. Two faculty members had left, and, and they brought me in to replace both of those people. And, and Ed Pappas and George Ziegelmuller kept you re, on. You replaced two people? I replaced two people. They didn't tell me that How about later that? He replaced on. two people. And they kept on saying, oh, well, we have a great opportunity for you. You can teach another class. We don't let all of our assistant professors teach this class, but just this once, we'll let you teach this class. Right. Well, my first year, I taught six different graduate courses. I about died. They worked <laughs> me so hard. But it was, it was all good. I learned a lot. Yeah. Um, so I, Good I, way to start. It was a good baptism way to start. Baptism of fire. It was a baptism of yeah, fire. Right. And um, so I worked with a lot of wonderful graduate students early on, a lot of wonderful undergraduate students, and, and went through my six-year period of, of pre-tenure. And then I was fortunate enough to be tenured at the university. Um, well, granted I mean, the title of professor. Uh, granted the title of associate uh, professor associate at that professor. time. Associate professor, all right. So, uh, and at that time I, I was doing a lot of different things working with graduate students and I was invited to go over to the graduate school at Wayne State 
we, we were one of the top 10 graduate programs in the country at that time. The star is rising. Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, <laughs> the star something was is rising. rising. Something right. was rising. Yeah, that's great. So I, I went over to the graduate school and I worked as an associate dean of the graduate school for about four years uh, and had a wonderful experience. It was, it was a challenging time in the graduate school. But you missed the department. I missed the department and the department missed me, I think, more. Uh, and the department asked me to come back, and the dean asked me to come back. So I did. I came back to the department as a professor and continued my teaching and my research. And about two years after I came back to the department, I applied and was promoted to full professor. Um, I had been doing a lot of work at that time. My specialty is crisis and disaster communication. The big joke is that's why they made me dean, right, right. because you know I know about <laughs> crisis about crises and, disaster. and disasters. Right. Not true, but uh, uh, I, had, I had been doing a lot of work with the Centers for Disease Control. I had done some work on 9-11, and so I was promoted to full professor. Okay, and then you went to department chair? Became department chair. And then after that, you went to dean? Uh, I was department chair for six years, and then they made me dean. So here you are. We'll be right back after this message, continuing to talk to Dean Matt Seeger. We're back with Dean Matt Seeger, and here he is. Now. Uh, and uh, we talked about uh, how you started uh, and came up through the deanship, and uh, the Department of Communication wasn't always called that. It was called Department of Speech, and then Department of Speech Communication, yes. Department of Communication. Tell us what it was like when you got here and how it evolved uh, to be what it is now, okay? Well, it was a really interesting time. Uh, the Department of Communication at, at uh, Wayne State was really a, a college uh, for all intents and purposes. At one point, we had theater, communication disorders and sciences, journalism, radio, TV, film, and speech communication, which was sometimes called communication and rhetorical processes. So it was, it was a huge, huge department. And Ed Pappas was the chair. He really was the director or the dean at that point because it was such sure. a big department. Right. When I came, uh, theater had been broken off to create a new college of, of fine arts. So we had the four areas of communication disorders, uh, speech communication, radio, TV, film, and journalism. Um, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I had uh, great senior faculty there to help me. I was so green. I was so wet behind <laughs> the ears. I, I think back to some of the things I did in those first classes, and I am embarrassed at what I did because the, the students, you know, I really was learning by doing, learning on, on the job. So you think and, about the past, <clears throat> smile a little bit, and move on. And right? move on, and move <laughs> on. But uh, in, in many of my graduate classes, I was the youngest person in the class because we had a lot of returning working professionals, people who had a lot more experience than I had. But, I, you know, I stuck with it, and, and I learned. And, you know, the, the students were really wonderful and were a great resource to help me learn how to be more effective as a teacher. But, you know, I also had George, I also had Bernie, I also had Ed, 
and they, they made a lot of opportunities available for me. How did the department change, uh, in your opinion, Department of Communication or Department of Speech when these other departments left? Well, what we, we became We became more focused. Right. Uh, and and we were able to focused on what? Well, more focused Debate, in terms of forensics? the curriculum. More right. focused on on you know message production on applied issues of communication. Uh, communication disorders and sciences left a few years after I came, and then right. we had journalism, uh, radio, TV, film, and uh, communication, speech communication at that time. So we, that was a much more coherent curriculum. Okay. And we were Let's able to work across Let's focus on, on uh, communication or speech communication because the legendaries that we're first going to talk about came from that area. Yep. And uh, isn't it fair to say that this department, of all the departments including athletics at, at, the, at this wonderful university, probably has earned more championships yeah. of state, local, uh, national, local, state, uh, at, than any other department, with <coughs> trophies filling up an entire corridor uh, uh, and so on. So here you are with a department that's really a national champion. Yeah, the, the, the competitive public speaking program, the forensics and the debate program at Wayne State is really a national leader. It has been. It's one of the first uh, real national programs in this area. Uh, George Ziegelmuller and, and his predecessors were just incredible in terms of building this program and building sure. this national reputation. Sure. I used to kid George, he came to Wayne State University the year I was born, 1957. So uh, he had an incredible <laughs> legacy and an incredible history here. Well, guess and what? 1957 <clears throat> is the year I graduated from high school. Well, there you go. <laughs> so we are going, we are going Where, back just uh, a few yeah, years. Right, hey, so, go. But I mean, the, the, the thing about Wayne State that's really important is, is there's this tradition of honoring speech and honoring the word and honoring you know, the fundamental process of, of communicating, of producing messages. And that's reflected in our journalism program, it's reflected in our radio, TV, our media arts program, but it's also very clearly f reflected in our forensics and debate program. And, and, and it's just a really core value of who we are as an academic. I'm glad department. you mentioned that because uh, core value comes from real people. I mean, I've talked about this for years when I talk about our great university here. It's a university of real people who have performed, who uh, when, when I was here uh, in the early, the late 50s, early 60s, the people that I went to school with became leaders and, yeah. uh, and, and people who were went, doctors and attorneys and public service and state senators and they, they went on. These were real people from a quality program. And you try to tell me that hasn't changed, has it? It, it has not changed. You know, the, one of the great things about Wayne State University is sort of the blue collar ethic. The, the people who come to Wayne State University, the students, the faculty, and the staff, they are not afraid to work. They know how to work. Many of them are working full time. They have second jobs. Uh, and, and they're here really to accomplish something. And so that, that ethic, that that desire to work, that willingness to sweat to make things happen really carries through everything that we do. Matthew Wayne Seeger, you are the personification of that. I know you work hard, you've come all the way. I know that, that this university holds your heart pretty closely and I think it always will. And thank you very much for coming with us. Uh, when we come back, we'll meet Ed Pappas one of the legendaries who's going to be a focal point of many of our programs because his memory is, is, is quite accurate. I mean, you know, and uh, you could go on and on about Ed Pappas. I know I could. I, He's I a could, mentor to me. but some of those me. stories he doesn't want me to tell. So. No. Well, <clears throat> what we're going to do about Ed Pappas uh, in, in the program about him is get him to talk about himself. Now, do you know how easy that's going to be? Ha! He'll, be he'll, he'll talk about you, he'll talk about me, he'll talk about all these people, but getting him to talk about himself is going to be pretty tough. But I think I have a plan and a way to do it. But that's for another show. Anyway, Matt, thank you very much. We'll be back after this message. Take care. Thank you.
And we're back. Hey. Well, now that we've seen the dean, we've seen uh, Dean Sigger and, and his, his background, now we're going into the meat of the presentation of what we're all about here, remembering things. And our first guest is really a guest that's going to be in every one of our shows because his memory is what we're depending on to drive this entire series of programs. He is a former high school teacher before he came to Wayne, one of the, one of the great debate coaches in the entire Detroit school system. He's uh, a baseball expert. He knows more facts about baseball than I could ever read in a number of books. I think you'll, you'll listen to that. Uh, he, he teaches a class here using baseball as a, the means of communication. I think we'll hear about that. But he, he served as chair for many years in the department. His, his blood is ingrained in this wonderful university of ours. You're going to love to meet him. Uh, my pal, I've known him for 50 years. When my wife went to Pershing High School in Detroit, he was her debate coach and mentor. And over the years, he's still been his, her mentor and my mentor. Uh, please welcome just a wonderful gal, a guy, did I say, a wonderful guy, Ed Pappas. Ed, come on in. <laughs> welcome in. Thank you. What do you think of our audience? Nice people, huh? Nice, Good kids. Nice, nice you see kids all the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, Ed, uh, you know, it's, it's something about, uh, about this wonderful university and all the years you've been going on. And, and uh, I thought we'd start by talking about what we're all about. We're going to be talking about famous people here at Wayne who uh, we're going to make famous maybe by talking a little bit more about them. But legendaries is what we're calling them, people who just had uh, an impact, franchise players, if you will. Good. Of this university, all of whom you remember. And uh, uh, so we're going to be asking you questions. We're going to bring in people in subsequent shows to talk about these people. And uh, uh, so uh, that's what we're all about. And I'm glad you're here to, to talk about it. And uh, we may even get some baseball terminology. Who knows? Oh, but boy. anyway, um, so we're going to talk about the legendaries here. Good. And. Uh, is it true I heard that some of these legendary people had nicknames? Is that true? Most of them had nicknames, Jim. Really? Yeah. Very unusual ones or? Unusual names. They really? Could. You mean like in baseball, like they would have Sparky, Dizzy, Daffy, yeah. Scooter, re like that, exactly. huh? Exactly. Really? Nicknames. I'll be darned. Well, here it is, Wayne State, whatever. So anyway, that's nice. But uh, let's talk about... Um, our series of programs, at least four of them anyway, that we're going to talk about. So who's the first one we're going to talk about? Who? That's what I'm asking. Who's the first one? That was his name, who? <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm not asking you. Uh, all I want to know is what's the name of the guy? No, no. What is the second guy? Who's the first guy? I'm not asking you what's the name of the first guy. Who's the first guy? Who? who? That's what I want to know. That's his look, name, it, who? Look, look, it's very simple, Ed. When the first guy... All these guys taught classes. There's they four did. of them. Okay, let's they say did. let's say when the first guy went to his class, walked in, stood in front of the students, who taught the course? Exactly. What? No, no, what's what second? What's the second? I don't know. He's the third guy. Wait a minute. All right. All right. No, wait. As I had, okay, wait a minute now. Who who's the first guy? What's the second guy? I don't know. There's a third guy. Exactly. So right. what you're saying, these are all right, so what you're saying is that when these guys taught here, and they come in the work in the morning, who says hello to what, what says hello to two, or to who, they both say hello to, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know, says that's hello it, to what it. and who. That's it. You know what? I don't care. That's the fourth guy. Oh! We'll be back. We'll be back after this message. I'm running to something. Always forward. Not afraid to do it myself. 
gotta fight to make a difference. Somebody's gotta lead. It's going to be me. I'll always aim higher. We're back with Ed Pappas, and uh, I wanted to say right off the bat on these shows that... Uh, off the that bat, that's nice. Off the bat. Off the bat, yeah, that's another good. baseball thing. Uh, we, <laughs> you're right. We're uh, <laughs> using first names here. Uh, nearly everybody you're going to see on the show has doctor's degrees. Uh, uh, and uh, for, uh, to make informality the key in these shows, we're going to use first names. Uh, you can pretty much assume that all of us have doctorates. Uh, uh, some of them don't, but we, we don't use the title here because we want to make it informal. So instead of uh, Dr. Pappas or Dr. Seeger, everybody you meet, Dr. Seeger, it's all going to be first names because that's the way we want it to be, right? Good. Okay. Baseball is something I want to talk about because you've interspersed baseball in your teaching. Uh, how long have you actually taught in your career, how many years? Actual teaching? Actual years, yeah. Well, this past fall was the 60th fall that I taught a class. Wow. Started in 19... 60 consecutive? 1956 was the first year, which was the year the uh, Yankees beat the Dodgers again. <laughs> so anyway, you don't mind if I use a little baseball? Of course not, because okay. I want to talk baseball. Good. But wait a minute. You said 60 consecutive. You went to Greece one time. I did. Well, that was uh, I went to Greece and taught. Uh, you taught the, in Greece. Taught the Greeks to keep your record. Yeah, they didn't know. <laughs> they didn't know anything about baseball, though. Right. <laughs> they don't have baseball in Greece. Right. They, they do now because they made it an Olympic sport for a while. Yeah. But not anymore. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I have here. What are, What we're going to do is give you a little test. So I think you know you're you know a lot about baseball. You know a lot more than I know. But let's, let's just see. What we're going to do, starting this program, is I have a collection of autographed baseballs. And we're going to bring one of them each show. And I'm going to show it to you and then ask you questions about this, about the... Good. About, I like see that. See if you can do that. Okay. Our first ball is the 1968 World Series Detroit, champion Detroit Tigers. Let me see it. You, have, you haven't seen that ball before, right? No. Okay. You ready for some questions? On sure. That? Okay. Well, the first name I see on it is the guy from Ohio State, and I don't like that. <laughs> that's, Joe's, that's Joe Sparma. Joe Sparma, sure. Al Kaline's right on top yeah. there. Uh, so, in fact, I got that in 1968. That's, I've had it all that time. Okay. 68 Tigers. Let's see. Uh, with the exception of Al Kaline, who came directly to the Tigers, never served in the... Uh, tell us by position of the starting players which ones came up through the Detroit Tiger farm system. Well, in 68, they all came up except for one. Okay, well, who are... D D well, there's... D go Dick right Ma through. Dick McAuliffe was at uh, second base. Um... The shortstop, uh, the third baseman was uh, Don Wirt. In left field was uh, L, uh, was uh, Willie Horton. Mickey Stanley was in uh, center field. Bill Freehand from Michigan was the catcher. And Al Kaline, the Hall of, Hall of Famer, was at, uh, in right field. And then, of course, their pitchers were Lolich, McLean, uh, Sparma, and uh, Earl Wilson. Yep, okay. Which one did you miss? You missed first base. No, no, and I, you purposely missed him because that's that, the one Norm, that Norm didn't. Cash. Norm Cash did not. He's the only one of all those starters who didn't come through the exactly right. farm system. How about that, you guys? That was an easy one. Man. That was <laughs> that was an easy one. Uh, yeah. If I just threw a uh, threw a nickname at you, we talked about nickname. Uh, give me the name. Uh, uh, okay, Dizzy. That's Paul. Paul Hannah Dean is. Dizzy Dean. Dizzy Dean. Okay. The last guy to win 30 games, except for Denny McLean, who became the, the, the most recent one. All right, Daffy. Daffy is Paul. I mean, Daffy is uh, Paul Dean. Okay, his brother. His brother, yep. Okay. Uh, Sparky. 
That's George Anderson. George Anderson. Okay. <laughs> Sp Sparky Anderson, you guys. May but the manager's name on this ball is Mayo Smith. Exactly right. Uh, he did not have much of a playing career. Did not. Nope. But yet he managed a world champion club. Yep. Tell us a little bit about Mayo and how this all happened. How could a guy like that come through without a big baseball career and go through a managerial well, it was career? It was, it was timing. He, he was with the Phillies before, and the Tigers had fired two or three managers in that interim, and he was available, and they hired him. And he, he inherited a good team. He had those outfielders like uh, Stanley and Horton and Kaline, and uh, they just missed the pennant in 30, in 67, and then they came back and won it. Um, it was a tight race, but they, they won it, and uh, then they went on and came back from a 3-1 deficit to win the World Series for the third time. And the star, McLean, Lolich? Lolich actually was the star of that yeah. series, along with Jim Northrup. Yeah. He's the other guy we didn't mention. Right. Lolich had what they call a rubber arm. What does that mean? That means he, he pitched 300 innings a couple of times. Nowadays, when a guy pitches 200 innings, they want to pull him away. This guy pitched 372 innings in 1960. Uh, it's later on, in uh, 80, 71 and 2. Wow. Okay. And he won three games in that World Series. Right. Three complete games. I have another question for you. See if you get this one. The Detroit Tigers, along with two other teams, established a record in 1935 that may never be equaled. What was that record? Are you talking about the RBI? Yeah. Well, there's one, but also the world champions. In 1935, the Tigers. Oh, oh you're talking about the 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 champ the year. Tigers, the Tigers won champion. the championship in 35. The Red Wings won the Stanley Cup. Uh, the Lions won the football NFL championship, yeah. even though there weren't that many teams then. And then Joe Lewis was the heavyweight boxing the, champion. Right. Yeah. And how about that, you guys? That's <laughs> Detroit. Hey, hey, Detroit. Wayne State, you know, Detroit. I'll tell you, uh, I go on this beautiful campus, and uh, uh, and I've uh, I've seen it when I was a student here back in the late '50s, and seen it all through the years. Visited many times and followed your career. Wayne State is uh, is changed physically, but the charm is still here. Well, it was interesting because you know when Millie, your your wife. Uh, see, I knew Millie before you did, you so did. anyway, yeah. <laughs> That's true. And I remember she sat right, the the instructor's desk was here in room 325, and she sat right to the, to the left, to the left of me, and she was a debater, and she was an outstanding debater, and so as she was getting finished with her senior year, I said, Millie, you're going to Wayne State, and you're going to debate for George Zigamuller, one of your legends. And so uh, she went there, became a highly successful college debater. And then, uh, a couple of years later, she was at the, in the College of Education and did a student teaching. And guess who was her critic teacher? I wonder who. Yeah, it was me again. Yeah, she loves it. Was, it. Yeah, so she it was nice. It. Yeah. it was it was good to have a, a really bright student yeah. like Millie. Yeah. Millie was great. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm one of those guys that married up. And so are you. Yeah, definitely. So are you. <laughs> um, uh, let's wrap it up a little bit by talking about your class with a baseball theme. How many years have you been doing this, teaching a baseball class? Well, it's been probably about uh, six or seven years. Okay. See, what happened is that they, uh, they, they made an announcement and said, if you have an idea for a theme class, uh, you know, submitted. And so I naturally submitted baseball as mine. You know, baseball is kind of a metaphor for life. Uh, there's a guy used to be president of uh, NYU who wrote a book called Baseball as a, as a Path to God. Can you imagine? He said in baseball we have saints and sinners. We have conversions. You know, 
uh, what's her name, Doris Kearns Goodwin, talked about when she moved from Brooklyn, where she was, where she was a Brooklyn Dodger fan, and then the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Dodgers left and went to Los Angeles. She moved to, uh, when she was teaching at Harvard, so she had to convert. And so their little boys became Red Sox fans, and so she converted to the Red Sox. Now, we in Detroit have never had to convert because the Tigers have always been with us for 115 years. Started in 1901, yeah. all the way through and here. And baseball has become such a part of our vernacular language. Oh, yeah. I mean, so you meet somebody and say, well, I thought I'd touch base with you and uh, That's right. You know, whatever. I got a pinch hit for him, you know, and sure. Oh, a lot of language. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we, you know, so you start this class. So anyway, and so what I... what was I, your whole idea behind it? Well, that, for me, it was a matter of, uh, in baseball, you had uh, gambling, you had scandals. You had the uh, Black Sox scandal sure. of 1919. Say it uh, isn't so, Joe. Say it ain't so, right. Joe. Uh, that's, that's where the uh, guy said, if legend uh, sure clashes... If legend clashes with truth, go with the legend. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. Shoeless Joe Jackson. Okay, so... Um, uh, from the Black Sox scandal to other well, scandals, then, to personal then, scandals, to the drugs, to the whatever. Whatever, okay. yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, so you wanted to really show people and uh, involve yourself with students in learning about how baseball transcends life in communication. Yep. I can't think of any other sport that is more into nonverbal communication then I mean you go like this 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 and you're conveying to some batter or a runner what they should be doing well, non-verbally well the, inter the interesting thing is that uh, the Cincinnati Reds had a catcher and back in those days uh, when when somebody had a this uh, something wrong for example he was deaf and so what do you think his nickname was <laughs> dummy Sure. His name was Dummy Hoy. He's in the Ohio Hall of Fame, but he couldn't hear when the umpire said uh, strike one. Or so that's when the umpire started to, you know, gesture. You know, nonverbal communication. That's it. Yeah. Strike. Boy, that's and uh, so that's got to be part of your class. Yeah, it is. Okay, and uh, uh, how would you rate it in terms of other classes that you taught regarding the success of the students? When they left, well, see that uh, that's that's a hard one because uh, the the classes that I've taught are honors classes. Sure. So these are kids that are the cream of the crop. Elite, yeah, right. Yeah, best of the bunch. And uh, it's it's kind of interesting is. And the bunch is pretty good. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I don't, I don't have. Uh, I used to get when I was teaching, uh, you know, just the regular population. I'd get a lot of jocks in the class you know, would take the class because they saw baseball in it. And they would try to trip me up, you know, they'd come in right. and say, Professor, do you know this or do you know that? And, and they couldn't, know it. They couldn't sure. trip me. Right, right, right. See, because now baseball... Scooter. A, Who was Scooter? Scooter Rizzuto. Rizzuto. Come on. So those, those are... That. You get that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could do a whole... Uh, I've had speeches on nicknames. The kids would give speeches on nicknames. Yeah, right, right. Um, that's a good subject to talk about regarding the class because they do give speeches. It's a public address class. Yes. So they prepare certain speeches on what besides nicknames? Well, there's, there's one, what, what are some of there's your one young topics? lady who did a magnificent speech. It just stunned me. It was so good on the history of the World Series ring. And she got uh, a picture of each ring from 1923, the first year they gave rings, all the way up to 2015. And she had them all up on this chart. And it was just as beautiful, wow. beautiful. Yeah. And you know, can you imagine the research that she did of course. on the rings? Of course. And then how much money the rings cost. There was a ring in, 19, uh, in 2008, the Phillies had won 103 games, and the ring had 103 l little diamonds. I'm amazed, Ed, uh, at the level of the student here at Wayne State, especially the honors class, but also 
generally do. Generally, they're willing to do that kind of research for one speech in one out of six classes that they're taking. Yeah, well, you see, I'd give them the, I'd give them the five P's of, Pappas is five, five P's of public speaking, okay. and one of them, of Pappas course. Pappas five P's. What are they? Well, they're, number one is purpose. Why are you up purpose, there? Purpose. What are you up there? Right. Number two is plan. Plan. How are you going to get to your goal? Okay. Three is uh, preparation. Hello, you got to prepare. You got to do research like the young lady did. Uh, four is um, four is uh, practice. Practice. Okay. You don't just get out and do it. You practice like you and I did outside. We did. Yes. What? Practice. You mean that wasn't that wasn't spontaneous? Are you kidding me? You're and then, giving away secrets. And then, <laughs> and then polish. Right. You know what polish is? Yes. The difference between eighty-seven and four score and seven. Can you imagine if Lincoln had gotten up and said, 87 years ago, would we be quoting his speech? But he said, four score and seven years ago. How about that? And ask, why don't you ask what your country, don't ask what your country, ask not. That's polish. Yeah, After that's you cool. get everything together, you polish it up. And there's one P that I can't teach, and that is passion. Passion. See, I can show How them. How you feel about it. How see, you when know? you came and talked to my class about uh, your... Uh, book on uh, uh, what's his name uh, Don yeah. Lund yeah well I mean that's that was you were passionate about yeah, that you know how I talked to the class in his baseball class you think I got up and talked to them are you kidding I did the signs yeah. <laughs> and here's the sign for a break ah! right there that's it we'll yeah. break we'll be back in a few seconds <laughs> Classic buildings. McGregor. School of Business. Apprentice. Old Main. The Freer House. We invite you to visit our medical school, known for urban clinical excellence. See where we perform. The Hillberry. Saber Hall. The Bonds Stand. The Alice. Visit a premier research university. Schedule a tour of our campus. Because one visit to Wayne State will lead to a lifetime of opportunities. We're back. I'm your host, Jim Irwin, and we're back with uh, Ed Pappas. And uh, we're talking baseball and education and Bambino. Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth, how about that? <laughs> uh, Ed is just uh, one of the foremost experts that I've ever not just met but heard of uh, in baseball statistics and so on. Baseball stats are probably uh, uh, more taken by people than other sports. What do you well, think? You know, you know, Jim, that's true. Why that's true, I, I can't really tell you, but there aren't very many people, if you were to go up to somebody and say, can you name the Super Bowl winners from the beginning? You know, the Packers won the Super Bowl in the first two, uh, 50, I mean, 78 and 79. And, you know, there have been several teams, except for the Lions, who have won the Super Bowl, several teams. I don't know if the Lions will win one in my lifetime, I'm in the ninth inning of my life, you know what I mean? <laughs> so anyway. Seventh uh, inning, seventh inning, seventh, little stretch. The stretch, here. okay. So, <laughs> but you know, when you talk about the World Series, yeah. I can start you from 1903 and go all the way up to 2015 and give you the name of the, you know, the World Series. But I don't think they can do that in hockey no. or in basketball right. or right. any place right. else. Right. So why, I don't know why that is, but. Uh, well, baseball, uh, uh, is our national 
pastime. Well, we don't have a national sport. We have a national pa like. Uh, you, uh, I just learned that hockey, uh, hockey is not Canada's national sport. Hockey is Canada's national pastime. Oh, okay. Their national sport is lacrosse, but who would know? But baseball seems to be at the heart of the growth of America. Every small town had a well, team. Well, it's, it's, it's at the heart of the growth. That's true. Yeah. That, that's true. Yeah. Except, uh, you know, if you look at impact now, I think uh, probably football is right there now. Sure. If somebody would say, who, we don't have a national, but somebody, let's declare a national sport, they'd probably say football. But, uh, but, uh, but football, the but football is, is only 16 games. That's true. Whereas in baseball, 162, yeah. 162 games. games. It yeah. starts in uh, April or late March right, right. and goes all the way through. Okay, you put your baseball hat on, put my football helmet on, we'll argue. <laughs> <laughs> if you want. Yeah. Uh, just uh, uh, moving on a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about some legendaries here. We've taken that adjective, put it into a noun, and uh, uh, I would hesitate to be the the person who uh, talked to George Zygermuller, who, who lives in Chicago now, to go and talk to him and say, "Hey, George, your nickname is who?" <laughs> I wouldn't yeah, want to be. The, don't do that. I wouldn't be the guy. <laughs> wouldn't want to be the guy to do no. that. But uh, we're uh, let's let's just go through some of the people we're going to talk about and. Uh, Give me a couple of sentences about him. Let's see, George Ziegelmuller. Well, George came to Wayne in 1957, as uh, as Matt had mentioned to you. The year after Wayne became Wayne State. That's exactly right. right. Okay. It became Wayne State, I think, in 56, yep. the year I graduated. And then 57, he came. And then in 58, Ray Ross came from Purdue. Right. We lured him from George Purdue. George Ziegelmuller. A couple of sentences about him. Well, his, he was. His, his impact. Well, his impact is so difficult to measure. I mean, he's got people in places all over the country. He's got debate coaches. I mean, his impact on forensics and debate is uh, incredible. And then, of course, he's got a, a very highly used book in argumentation. And George is just an expert in argumentation. Right, right. He knows it. Right, right. You it, took a class from him, and I did too. Right, oh yeah, it, just phenomenal. Okay, another name. Uh, Rupert Courtright. Rupert uh, was here. He was one of the individuals who was um, president of the National Association, which at that time was called the Speech Association of America. You know, as the um, 50s went into the 60s to the 70s, we got more away from the word speech and began to adopt the word communication so that now our national association is the Communication Association of America. Okay, and we'll be right back after this message, and, but here's how we're gonna do it. Here, we, how do you say, how do you give the sign? We'll be right back? Yeah, that's we'll it. We'll be right back. <laughs> Get things moving. No coast. I have big plans. Big ideas. My wheels are in motion. I will make a difference. Leave my mark. Get that degree. I'll always aim higher. We're back. Oh. Welcome back to uh, Remembering the Legendaries. I'm Jim Irwin, uh, your host, and this is Ed Pappas, uh, who we've been talking about, Ed, with baseball uh, and how it's infused into his uh, program, in his teaching program and in the departmental program. And, uh, and now we're just getting into a couple people that we're going to talk about, Ziggler Mueller, uh, Courtright, uh, uh, and... Uh, well, then, of course, George, George Bowman, who became... George Bowman, the th Mac the McMonagall. Who else would we be talking about? Who else should we talk about? Well, of course, there's... Uh, Ray Ross? The first, the first female who graduated from Michigan, Betty Youngjohn. Elizabeth she was, Youngjohn. She was our uh, rhetorician. Right, right. Well, you remember these people. You're going to talk about them. Good. And... Uh, uh, when it comes to George Ziegelmuller, uh we're going to devote a whole program to him. And I hope your wife comes other back people there. for that. I think she'll be back on uh, one of the panelists. Good. But, uh, anyway, this has been fun. 
you're going to continue to be part of our programming. I've drafted you. Uh, uh, as the next program might be a little bit difficult for me, but I'm going to trick you into it somehow. You're going to have to talk about yourself. And I know you don't like to do that, but I'm going to get you to do it. So it's been fun. We've talked to Dean Matt Seeger about the way it's developed. We've met Ed Pappas. We're going to see him in the next program. So we'll be back with Remembering the Legendaries. Thanks for watching, everybody.